Riverside Pleasure Pier had its heyday in the Victorian and Edwardian eras. Now, declining popularity, the inevitable corrosion of iron and steel, and the ever-increasing cost of repair have brought many piers into a crisis situation, not least at South. Early Victorian visitors enjoyed a stroll along Southport's wooden jetty, paying a penny or so to walk along its slippery boards. Construction started in 1859 using the jetting method. Water was forced down the hollow tubular iron piles. This displaced the sand, letting the piles sink into position. The structure grew quickly. In one favorable week, 450 feet of the pier was erected. August the 2nd, 1860. The opening was a grand affair, with a ball, gala procession, illuminations, fireworks, and banquet. The new pier was 1,200 yards long and five yards wide. Financially, the pier was successful. Stevenson's Guide to South says, As you step out for a bracing walk, it seems not unlike being upon the deck of a ship. You have the breeze and the sea without the rolling or pitching of a vessel. The scene is of no little animation and gaiety. Visitors will remember it and its pleasant associations when they remember little else. The pier was extended and improved. The 1868 extension increased its length to 1460 yards providing better facilities for shipping. At the end of the 19th century, the fishing fleet exceeded a hundred vessels, trawling the fishing grounds of Morecambe Bay, North Wales, and the Isle of Man. Excursion steamships, including the Bickerstaff, Wellington, and Bell, visited the Fylde Coast, Liverpool, Landedno, and Dublin. In August 1923, the paddle steamer Bickerstaff left Southport Pier for the very last time. The Boghole Channel had become unnavigable due to silting, and so it has remained to the present day. The pier has had its share of disasters. On February the 3rd, 1889, there occurred a terrible gale. Next morning, it was discovered that the ebbing tide had carried away the foundations, completely wrecking the refreshment room. But worse was to come. On September the 18th, 1897, Police Constable Lawrence saw a fire coming from the pavilion, shops and decking. Within a very short space of time, nearly the whole of the area limited by the tramway terminus at one end and the pier shops at the other was a mass of flames. A more elaborate pavilion was built at the pier entrance in 1902. Entertainments also continued at the pier head, with pieros and band concerts. A more unusual spectacle was provided from the turn of the century by a succession of divers, including Professor Osborne, Professor Pearson, and the most famous Professor Pousey, who occasionally dived into the sea astride a bicycle and sometimes enveloped in flames. In the early hours of Monday, 24th of July, 1933, tragedy struck. The second and most serious fire in the pier's history was believed to be caused by a discarded cigarette end. The entire pier head was destroyed. Miss Blanche Lawton's pier orchestra suffered a mortal blow, losing instruments and sheet music. The pier company never recovered from this, and sold the entire structure and pavilion to Southport Corporation in 1936 for 34,750 pounds. The pier was shortened, using an earlier structure as the new pier head, 
with a stage for open-air entertainments, a cafe and amusement arcade. After the Second World War, a short extension on concrete piles was provided to accommodate a sun deck. Jim Walsh, now a foreshore inspector, started working on the pier at that time. The first time I had a job on the pier was when I was a student, was in 1954. In the old office, probably an inspector in it, there'd be a chief attendant, a toll clerk, there'd be a gate man. You would have a guard on the train, train driver, pier headman, a patrolman as well, and you'd have a person halfway. We had um, quite a number of uh, regular people that came down. Uh, one that uh, comes to mind is uh, a Bernard Litwack, who was um, a local uh, uh, bookmaker and uh, also a very keen uh, athlete and swimmer. A daily visitor to the pier we used to have uh, a Miss Naylor who used to wear very large hats. Fishing competitions on the pier, they're still running. They're popular with the local uh, fishing society, the Southport Sea Angler Society. They have matches and uh, in the day and at night time, all, all through the year. It just all depends on the tides generally, you know, with, uh, when they hold the matches. But often at weekends, because of the uh, there's certain members, you know, not working, I suppose. If the tides run right at the weekends, that's when the fishing matches will be. Nelly Marshall, who worked for several years in the pier cafes, and retired as catering manager for Sefton Council. Three men used to come down every day at the same time. And there was a lady came down. She came down every day to feed the seagulls. Regardless of the weather or anything, she'd just come to feed the seagulls. So much so that we didn't know a proper name, we just called the seagull Susie. Entertainments continued at the pier head. I think it was 1957 or, uh, or 58, we had, uh, for one or two seasons, we had uh, Harry Marsh uh, and his family frolics. I think his wife, Jessica, and uh, they had Tommy Nightingale on the piano. From early days, transport was provided. The original hand-pushed tram carrying 20 passengers ran along the middle of the pier. It was later cable-operated from a steam engine in this building. In 1905, the tramway was electrified, the two open cars being trailers. Another driver also at the time was uh, Arthur Clark, who uh, had a wooden leg. And uh, my father often mentions uh, at times that uh, he would place this uh, wooden leg on the uh, live rail to the consternation of a lot of the passengers. After the corporation had brought the pier, new bodies like those of Blackpool's trams, were fitted on the existing chassis. And the train we had at that time, uh, the Silver Bell, it, it was comfortable even if it was bad weather to go down the pier. Uh, we had closed carriages, two closed carriages, and they held uh, 48 people each. The Silver Bell was later replaced by the English Rose. Nowadays you can take somebody to drive the train and you can just introduce them and say, well, you pull this lever and that and they're, and they're away. Um, but in those days we were out a fortnight learning the craft of uh, stopping. When it was, say, this summer weather and warm and greasy, you know, you used to just slide along, you know, at times it could be quite frightening. During that period, literally many thousands of seas uh, enter the pier. And the most popular attraction on the pier is the pier train. If the pier train wasn't there, well, then obviously there wouldn't be as many people. The ship's cabin bar at the pier head was a popular spot. The cabin, as they called it, for the drinks. You know, it had all barrel seats. The barman was quite a character then, day, uh, Jack Nicholas. 
In 1953, 20,000 lamps were used to create the pier illuminations, part of the town's gala week. A spectacular firework display lit up the sky. Six years later came a real blaze, on June 2nd, 1959. A chap called in the house, he said, I wouldn't go into work tomorrow because it's burning down. <laughs> Jack Mather that worked for the uh, amusement arcade was in and out collecting money uh, out of the machines and had to be dragged away. To, on the next day, uh, there were uh, lots of people uh, under the pier searching for uh, money, uh, which when found was all welded together in bags. But that year was a very busy year for us although we had nothing at the end of the pier. The present cafe, bar and amusement arcade at the pier head replaced the buildings lost in the 1959 fire. The pier pavilion opened in 1902. Artists appearing included Charlie Chaplin, Gracie Fields, Flanagan and Allen. It's claimed that they sang underneath the arches for the first time. In 1934, the pavilion became a dodgem car track, but reopened ten years later as the casino, a cafe and ballroom. A few summer shows were followed by years of repertory, mainly by the Southport Repertory Company and the Victoria Theatre Company. By the 1960s, the timber parts of the structure were decaying. In 1969, at a time before the interest in conservation, the theatre was demolished. The Golden Goose Amusement Arcade, Dixieland Show Bar and Golden Fry Restaurant were built on the site, with the pier entrance between them. Apart from minor alterations and changes of name, they still remain the same, although the former dance hall and arcade have become a family leisure centre, now operated by Silcock Leisure. Seaside, isn't it? I mean, it isn't seaside without a pier. And it's wrong to take it away from Southport. It is, it is a good attraction. This is what Southport's all about. It could be made to be a lot better than it, all, than it uh, already is if it had been cared for over the years rather than just let go down and down and down. It's nice to uh, drive, drive here from Bolton. And uh, when we get here, it's, uh, we always expect the sunshine, which you know, we're usually lucky, you know. So uh, we just come to relax for now. And we always like the pier because of, uh, we expect the sea to come in there and <laughs> I did see it three weeks ago. But I like to come out on that train. I think it's a, it's a nice run out. Even if you get the train to come out here and then turn around and have a drink of tea and go back again. Definitely good. Brilliant. Tourism and Attractions Officer Phil King is responsible for the pier, along with Southport's other attractions. When the pier closes down in the middle of October, uh, a lot of maintenance work is done on the train and other particular areas. However, over the past number of years, we've been opening the pier uh, over the Christmas period. And hopefully that will continue. I would like to see the pier open all the year round. The pier has its problems though. Doug Turner, former director of engineering and technical services. As far as I'm concerned, the pier represents a problem. A, for the physical maintenance of it, and its rapid, increasingly rapid corrosion. And the other one is the obstruction to a normal highway route. And in 1974, we took down one span of the pier, and instead of supporting the deck from underneath, we support it from on top. In order that we could create better headroom for traffic going through it, I now look at that coastal road and whenever it has bridges over, they ought to have standard 16 foot 6 minimum clearance. Some 10 years or more ago, we had a full-time blacksmith working on the pier. We 
tend nowadays to resort very much more to crisis maintenance. We've got a problem maintaining the pier. Do we want it all? This in engineering terms would certainly be a convenient point at which to cut it. It does seem to me that if we're making that part of the borough a focal point for the leisure activities, maybe more rather than fewer people will be attracted to walk along what would remain of the pier out over the beach and, and, and the seaward end. The other merit, apart from the uh, way in which you would improve the traffic movement facility, is that um, certainly if you've only got half a decaying structure to maintain, uh, that is going to have some impact on the cost. It was one of the first to be built uh, in that form of structure. There's some merit in preserving part of the pier on that engineering historic account. Southport Pier is at a crossroads in its history, with estimated repair costs of nearly a million pounds. Will it be preserved and improved to give delight to thousands in years of increased leisure and tourism? Will half of it have to be sacrificed to combat the cost of maintenance? Or will it end up as hundreds of tons of scrap iron, perhaps making tomorrow's cars and saucepans with not a fragment of railing left to tell its tale.